and howdy. See if I can get this to go to full screen. So finally, we get to video three, and we're going to start talking about strategic risk. And I'm going to just I'm going to give you about half of that this week and half of this next week. Um, I mentioned on office hours Monday night, and so I want to repeat it here for those of you who weren't there. A couple of interesting business articles this week. The McDonald's CEO was fired. He was a unbelievably successful CEO in terms of business. He had uh, brought the stock price back. He had turned the business around. He incorporated a great management team, but the board fired him. And the board fired him for one reason. He was dating an employee. He was the CEO, he was dating an employee in a violation of a company policy that he had helped create. And we're talking about a guy who makes 15 million a year without bonus, so, you know, he'd think he'd be a little smarter on this, and he agreed that he should be let go, that he had violated the policy. A second news story this week was on a, um, uh, Under Armour being investigated both by the SEC civilly and by the D Department of Justice criminally for accounting mismanagement. They didn't overstate their sales, as I understand, but what they did is they moved sales from quarter to quarter to make the company look healthier than it was. Now, what does this have to do with strategic risk? Both of these behaviors have something to do with risk. Look at McDonald's. Why did the board go on and fire him? Why didn't they just reprimand him? Because in 2019, dating an employee in violation of stated company policy by the CEO, the leader of the ship, so to speak, cannot be overlooked. I've read some analysis on this. Even though everyone agreed he was a terrific CEO, he was very smart, he knew what to do, and to his benefit, he brought in a great management team that will probably continue on his work. Secondly, Under Armour is more problematic. They took an accounting risk. Now, how does that form into strategic? Well, I think what feeds into strategic, and we're going to talk about this, one of the biggest is compliance. They were not compliant. They are a publicly traded company. They report to the SEC. There's something called the material rule. Uh, and they violated this in some commentators' opinions because they should have disclosed anything that would materially affect an investment, and they did not. And they had been investigated for a number of months, three or four months before this was released. And it's also possible criminal charges. So it's strategic risk. This isn't one person acting badly. This is a group of people who frankly know better. They're CPAs, they're lawyers. They have to look at the risk. What if we get caught? What is our payout? If we don't get caught, we're gonna, okay, we've got more market, sh we've, we've communicated that we're uh, a more viable company. You know, is that worth the trade-off of being held non-compliant, having a criminal investigation by the Department of Justice? So strategic risk is a lot of things. Yes, it affects another type of risk we're gonna talk about in subsequent weeks called financial risk and possibly operational risk. But strategic risk are all those things that we have 10 subcategories. We're going to talk about five of them in this lecture that goes into that. So basically, it's any unexpected changes in key elements of strategy, formulation, or execution. That's a classical definition. In one of the previous lectures, I mis mentioned how, you know, in older days, people wore Swiss-made watches. They were wonderful. They were so precise. They kept wonderful time. Strategically, the watch industry in Switzerland missed the fact that there was this new technology coming along and now everyone wears electronic watches and electronic watches have become basically computers on your arm um, and this was taken over by the Japanese industry who saw this who saw this that there's a way to make cheap watches that were just as reliable as the Swiss made mechanical watches but could have all these extra features so strategic risk can be missing the market, it can be uh, doing something illegal like Under Armour has allegedly done, doing something dumb like the CEO of McDonald's has, has done, he's admitted that he's done it, 
So it basically arises when a company fails to anticipate the market's needs, and not only the market's needs, but we're talking about what the market expects, not just in terms of what I need, but what does the market expect to meet them? Would people not have gone to McDonald's because the CEO was dating a person in the company? I doubt it. I doubt if I'd say, I'm not going to McDonald's because I found out this happened. Would people uh, quit buying Under Armour? Most people probably aren't even going to be aware of this. Uh, but yet we've seen it in Chick-fil-A. We see people where they make a strategic decision that they're not going to be open on Sundays, which ironically offends some people. And they have what is considered to be an anti-attitude towards a uh, group of people. This is a strategic this is a strategic, they're not meeting that, they're failing to anticipate the market's needs and what the market expects from them. And by the market, of course, we mean customers. So I mentioned the 10 categories, subcategories. We're going to give the first five this week, the next five next week. So here's the 10. I've already highlighted governance as being the big one that's going to shut down uh, Under Armour. Uh, other ones are just... Now, our external relations in the in the um, uh, McDonald's case, how we, how we view our shareholders, what what we want our shareholders to think. So let's look at these. So before we talk about them, I've listened here. So just what happened this week in business as examples, and those are the negative ones. There's some good things that happen where someone takes a strategic risk because they've understand the complexity of that and they've assessed that risk. I've got a surprise for you at the end. So let's talk about the first one, execution. When strategy is not implemented as executed, I'm going to overpromise and underdeliver. So now this is variable by both company and industry. We expect more from the aerospace industry, i.e. I'm going to get on a plane and it's going to land and I'm going to be safe, than I think we do the automotive industry because if something happens in a car, it's more likely I'm going to survive than if something happens on a plane, right? So when a strategy is not implemented as expected, think of that with Boeing. Boeing made a strategic decision that has affected now its reputation, uh, how people have confidence in its technology. I'm talking about the latest two uh, Big Macs um, crashes where the, where the Boeing CEO admitted that they, he knew about the first plane crash, that, that there were pilots complaining about it. So it usually comes down to resources. Hey, I'm oh, I'm over. I don't have the money. I don't have the people. I can't get the right people. I can't get to the data. Whatever. Alignment, aligning with the stakeholder commitment, government. It says here ambiguity and uncertainty. One of the things McDonald's board did is had this investigation, made their decision, executed their decision, and went public. Great strategy. Commentators loved it. I listened to two different business uh, radio commentaries on this, Bloomberg Radio and uh, CNBC, and they both said, McDonald's, you get an A. You took this path. You had to do it in 2019 in the post-Me Too. You know, it's, yes, everyone agrees this guy was an excellent CEO in other regards. And then you have the emotionally cognitive and social risk. So... Habits, fear, diminished autonomy, you know, how we used to look at Sears and Roebuck now, as a, then as, opposed, uh, as now. It used to be a very powerful company. In its early days, it actually sold kits to make homes, right? Um, social dissatisfaction, you'll see this come about now. You know, one thing I talked about last night, and I want to repeat for this, since not everyone was in the office hours, is we know technology is changing, and it's changing so quickly sometimes I feel like we can't stand, just keep up with it. And I'm not saying that as, an, as a person of a certain age. I'm saying that because we'll talk about AI and how we're going to use it in all these different industries, and machine learning, how we're going to use this, and this, and this, and this. I mean, we really can't keep up with all the possibilities and opportunities that, that technology has given us. But when we talk about technology change, we also have to realize that the world is changing and the social order is changing. And this is impacting our business models. 20 years ago, having a CEO date an employee, no one would have batted an eye. No one would, no one would have been fired. 20 years ago, before Enron, Under Armour's financial malfeasance, it might have even rose, risen to criminal then, but it would have been no big deal. Post-Enron, big deal. Okay, 
So when we talk about this, let's talk about not only how technology is changing, but the world and society is changing. And as a result, this is going to impact your strategy. You've seen companies make strategic decisions to pull out of certain markets so as not to offend. Um, I uh, think it's kind of ironic. Uh, Purdue students, where I, my undergraduate recently had a petition to pull Chick-fil-A from their uh, campus because of Chick-fil-A's alleged anti-gay attitudes. Well, look at Panera Bread. That family that owns Panera Bread and other restaurants was from a German family that used slave labor in World War II. Hmm, did, did anybody go after this? Um, you know, it's kind of dangerous, and I'm not saying you should go after one or the other or both, but what I'm saying is with this social and world expectations, how we view the environment and all this, it becomes your strategy. Nothing is off the table from an executive dating an employee, to how you treat the environment, to where the founders came from, to what the founders believe, and the like. So there's another article, and I think all these should be posted. I'll double check. And it basically says, how are we going to do it? And it makes it sound like this is as easy as making cupcakes. You know, you beat the eggs, you mix in the flour, you throw them in the oven. We're going to map the strategy. Well, here's the problem with that. Strategic thinking is an art, you know. When did Apple decide they weren't a music company? Do you know this story that Apple, uh, who makes the iPods, watches, and everything, they signed an agreement with the Beatles early on when they took on the name Apple <coughs> because the Beatles' original music record company was called Apple. And in that agreement, Apple, the Steve Jobs Apple, said, we are, we're a computer company. We're never going to get into music. Oh, hold on your horses there, Steve. Guess what? Every time uh, Apple had a uh, iPod or their streaming or anything that was in music, they ended up having to pay the Beatles for this agreement. So <clears throat> even a genius like Stephen Jobs in the early days of Apple couldn't foresee where the, that industry, that company would take him or where he would take that company is maybe a better way to say it. Now thinking of Apple, you think about Apple music, you think about you know your watch playing music, whatever. Uh, you can't imagine that this company one time said strategically, we're not going to get into the music business, we're a computer company. So when you map that strategy, it's, it's easy to talk about setting out goals and all that. This is a course and probably a degree in itself, as is identifying the risk using your strategy. Sometimes it's a brainstorming. We tend to say, well, okay, I'm going to be the customer. What's something I'm not going to like as the customer? I'm going to look at it from the process perspective. What's something that could go wrong in the process of making the product or service? And then you have to look at what, you have to stand back and say, what are these risks? How do we categorize these risks? What are the criteria for these risks? High, medium, low? What's the impact? Remember our risk maps from last, month, uh, last week? Our, uh, our little table? It's the same thing. Then we have to assess that risk. And, you know, this again, I, boy, I wish I knew how to do this because I'd be a billionaire because a lot of this based on financial impact and likelihood of occurrence, but what's a lot of times being missed in this new world and these new business models that we are in the middle of is something like reputation risk. How do you put a dollar sign on that? <clears throat> and then we're going we're gonna to control those risks. We're going to fix them. We're going to look at them. We're going to put them around a fence. We're going to do all these great words according to this strategy execution, but this in itself is difficult to do. So the takeaway is the best thing we can do at this point is be aware of our strategy, question our strategy, look at our strategy from different viewpoints, capture the risk that we can, realize that risk uh, identification is dynamic. In the old days of cybersecurity, we used to do risk assessments once or twice a year. Well, in 2013, we had a paradigm shift in our standards that said, no, this is continuous. Can, we call it continuous monitoring. The same thing here. We have to continuously monitor the risk, such as for reputation, for compliance. I bet there's a lot of companies right now that are looking at Under Armour and McDonald's and saying, uh-oh, better make some changes now before we're on the front page and being talked about by Bloomberg and CNBC and the like. A second type of cat the subcategory is the strategy itself. 
So you picked your products, your distribution channels, your markets, and it doesn't match expectations. I think I used the Osborne example in an earlier lecture, the, the company that pioneered and basically invented the portable computer, although they weren't portable, they were transportable compared to today's laptops, uh, went bankrupt between their first and second product, right? Because they couldn't get their uh, products to market, they ran out of money. Uh, the people were actually the opposite, their expectations for the second Osborne kind of caused them to cancel the first Osborne. Again, the strategy, the uh, strategy in execution and all this, matching the expectations. Apple's uh, gotten some commentary this past week or so because it's not making as much money as Wall Street anticipates that it'll make, right? It doesn't match expectations. This is as bad as uh, it, it, the company can still be profitable. It can still be making tons of money. Uh, Tesla's another one. It doesn't match expectations, and people uh, start prodding around. We have to remember that these are publicly traded companies, and our country is a capitalistic country that rises and falls on um, the stock market. So expectations of the market are very important. Here's my big one, governance. Occurs when governance is not functioning as expecting. That is, the enterprise, for whatever reason, is ignoring regulations, laws, and policies that are required. And by required, I mean by agencies, by governments, governmental entities. We see this now with the rise of GDPR, with its extraterritorial jurisdiction reaching in to American companies. Uh, this is what Under Armour did. You know, those regulations that were put into effect by the SEC. They basically ignored them. The SEC, a federal agency, that doesn't like that because its job is to police publicly traded companies so the market is not only fair and accurate, but also viable. SEC does not want the public to lose confidence in the market. That would be very bad. So it's got to punish Under Armour for blatantly ignoring regulations and the like. Uh, two examples that my TAs found here are Siemens bribery scandal, hurt, hurt Siemens very much that this was going on, and one that is close to the heart of most people in the Houston area was Enron, which was not only completely destroyed by its creative accounting, but basically took down the, uh, destroyed a lot of its employees because their retirement was 100% invested in Enron. Enron also, uh, again, it was strategic, let's, let's do some off, uh, I can't remember exactly the term now, but off account counting where they uh, yeah, and they moved accounting numbers from one of their entities to another to create this bogus look that the company was making tons of money. Um, the reputation. Uh, uh, we've had a uh, another one that's not listed on this slide, but Theranos, which uh, the founder of that is still facing criminal indictment. And quite frankly, I hope she's indicted. If you haven't, uh, if you want a book to read over your break when you put your feet up and you're through the classes for a while. Bad Blood is written by the Wall Street Journal reporter who broke that story. Um, totally bypassed governance. Totally decided that company was just, you know, so important and had this wonderful technology, which in fact was fraud, that it didn't have to abide by those pesky regulations when it sold the government uh, testing under Medicaid and Medicare funding. Didn't have to uh, abide by the SEC when it, it took in money and all the like. So there's plenty of bad examples. And what happens is we tend to react. So after Enron, we put in Sorbanes-Oxley. Another is external relations. And this brings us back to one of my favorite words of stakeholders. Unexpected changes in the company's relations with external stakeholders. McDonald's is a good example. Hey. We have this policy in place. Our CEO violated it. He will be fired. It will be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, probably the New York Times. It will be talked about in business. But it is important to us to keep our external stakeholders confident that we do what we say. And by external stakeholders, we mean the public. Could be media, could be consumers, could be customers, could be whatever that walks into our stores. Our reputation is that important. Facebook didn't learn this. Facebook uh, sold data collected from their users for targeted political advertising. They lost $100 billion in value. 
Uh, I had uh, caught up with a friend on Sunday afternoon who totally believes 100% that Mark Zuckerberg will eventually be in prison. <laughs> I, I don't think it does, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But its reputation will probably never recover. Based on that and some other high-profile decisions it made, such as refusing to use strong encryption uh, in its messaging service when it knows that it is, in fact, enabling criminal activity, including uh, child porn. There's a New York Times article last Sunday of September on this. So how do you evaluate the external relations risk? You know, how do you feel like, what do you owe society? What do you owe the public? What if that public isn't your customer? What do you owe them? You know, do you pollute? You know, who are you affecting? So we need to look at this from a very holistic standpoint. It's, 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 the planning to sell data from its users is now getting a lot of uh, commentary in the tech community um, because it's basically profiting from data that people believed was going to be held private. Now, you can argue from Facebook's viewpoint, look, you guys aren't paying to be on Facebook. How do you think we were making money? Well, gee, we thought you were targeted ads. We didn't think you were going to do this to our data. How do you evaluate this risk? Great question. Because of what happened to Facebook. They didn't break a law. They broke public trust. They lost value. Now, they're, I believe their stock has come back up. I don't know if it's come back as much as it was but they continue to have a reputation problem and it's very hard to evaluate that. They pay their risk managers a lot of money and have a lot of them and I don't believe anyone stood up five or six years ago and said, this will be a bad idea. Another subcategory is strategic relations and that's with another company, uh, parent company, joint venture company or whatever. If you don't know the history of Enron, there's some great books uh, started by a Fortune article written by Bethany McLean, who basically said, you know, these guys think they're the smartest guys in the room, wrote an article for, I think it was Fortune magazine, and later became a book, and she was the first one that called them out and basically said, how are you guys making money? This doesn't make any sense. Well, it's, that has to go with strategic relations because if you map out what Enron did, they had created these joint ventures and these uh, whole pathway of different companies to move their accounting from one to another to create this bogus uh, story that they were making a lot of money from basically gambling on energy futures, right? Well, all you needed was a house of cards. All you had to do was pull one card and the thing came down. Same thing, so what happened is we had Arthur Anderson, who was, the one of, who was their um, accounting firm, one of the big six, I think, at that time. I think we're down to the big four. SEC requires a third-party audit from one of these firms, so you know they know they're going to have a ton of work every year. Well, Arthur Anderson was really arrogant about its accounting, and they made their consulting company spin off under a different name called Accenture. Accenture didn't want to do this because Arthur Anderson had such a brand. Accenture it was a made-up word. It was the best thing that could have ever happened. So Arthur Anderson does not exist anymore due to Enron. Their partners lost all their equity. Uh, it went out of business. And Accenture, through blind luck, wasn't tainted. It was no longer Arthur Anderson Consulting. It was Accenture. So an unexpected change in strategic relationships with a parent company or joint venture party or subsidiary or whatever sometimes can be as beneficial as bad. Now, we've got another article in here uh, on five steps to maintain strategic relations. I'm not going to go through this. I just put it here for you. It's on your slides. Uh, other than to make this point, we live in a very interconnected world. Our strategic partner relationships may be international. They may be global. We may have a culture clash. They may have, be under a different compliance. Uh, all this stuff may go on because we live in a very global environment. So next week's part two, I'm going to ask you to pay special attention to what happens with McDonald's this week and Under Armour. And there's another one, and I'm going to uh, go to this quickly. It's Barron's article, and it's basically where, a, again, a person who should have known better, oh, I hit my surprise slide, who should have known better um, made some very 
sexist comments and ran a multi-hundred million dollar firm and is now going under because Goldman Sachs and these other companies are pulling their money out of this because of his backlash. And I'll put this on an email to check this out. Um, and so here's what I wanted to, so anyway, this week, be very sensitive to what's going on in the business environment. McDonald's, look at the strategic risk. What was that related to? Under Armour, what was their strategic risk? How did they fail at that? Fisher Investments, having a CEO who, you know, mama didn't teach him not to say certain things. Hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. And at the same time, let me give you a positive story. Roger Penske bought the Indianapolis 500 racetrack. Now, those of you that don't know, the racetrack was originally set up, two and a half mile oval, flat track, for automotive testing in the early days of the automotive industry. And then someone had the bright idea of, hey, why don't we have a race? Uh, which I don't know when it started, in the teens or 20s. Um, here's a very interesting news story that happened this week. Roger Penske, who started as a race driver, he's a Lahai graduate in business, started as a race driver, gave that up at 28, uh, owns, I think, um, one of the truck rental companies, uh, owns several race car, uh, has all this stuff going for him. He's 82 years old, had a kidney transplant a few years ago. And it's a very interesting strategic risk because out of the blue, it was announced yesterday that he is buying the Indianapolis 500, taking it from the Holman family who had owned it for like 75 years. Uh, if you know anything about Indiana, Rose Holman Inst uh, co College, that's part of their family. I can't remember how they made money. It's something simple, but tons of money. Um, and so here's an interesting strategic risk because the first thing that came out is, hey, Roger, your team has won more trophies, 17 or 18, I can't remember the last count, uh, than any other team in racing history. Isn't this a conflict of interest? Well, Roger Penske is somebody I have long admired for how he has reinvented his companies through the years. Started as a, you know, Lehigh graduate, races cars for a few years, gives that up, starts uh, buying companies. At one time, he was going to buy Saturn from GM, looked at the balance sheet, looked at everything. If you remember Saturn, said you can't make a deal out of it, walked away. Saturn no longer exists. Uh, uh, budget, one of the uh, uh, moving, not moving companies, but trucks that you rent, uh, he owns. There's a bunch of, you know, look around and see all the time you see the name Penske. So I'm very interested in this from a viewpoint as the commentators get on this kind of surprise move to say, okay, Mr. Penske, smart guy, business guy, this was a great strategy. This was a great strategy. I think it's actually best for the 500 as well but it'll be interesting to follow these stories. Thank you for listening. See you next week.